Aloha Kako. Welcome to the show Policy for the People. I'm your host, Minara Mordecai. The show is dedicated to unveiling pressing issues that are facing Hawaii and attempting to identify policies that will provide good and just solutions. Today's show is dedicated to rethinking and redefining what economic inequality looks like in Hawaii. What does it mean to move away from deficit thinking to abundance? I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Janice Ikeda. She's the executive director of Vibrant Hawaii, which is a community organization based in Hilo, Hawaii Island. Vibrant Hawaii is also a collective impact movement representing many organizations. I will let my guests introduce Vibrant Hawaii in detail, but first, Janice, welcome to the show. Aloha Minara, mahalo nui for having me. Welcome, I'm so happy to have you. So tell us more about what, um, who makes up Vibrant Hawaii? What are the straight stakeholders organizations and why was it important to create it? Yeah, so a few, it started with a few stakeholders and they um, called themselves the SAM, small and mighty. And it really was a small and mighty group that came together, just a handful of folks that included um, Chancellor Rachel Solemsas from Hawaii Community College, um, Alapaki Nahalea representing Kamehameha Schools on Hawaii Island. There was Carol Ignacio, who's a phenomenal community leader um, who actually started both the Food Basket and Hope Services Hawaii on our island. Charlene Iboshi, who was a retired prosecuting attorney and um, a couple of folks representing the mayor's office from the county. So a diverse group of stakeholders, they came together concerned about the Alice report that came out in 2018. And what they saw was um, the high number of Alice Hawaii Island leading the state in Alice um, and the trajectory from 2016 to 2018, where it had grown by 14% and just seeing year upon year, the number of Alice households on our island growing. And so there was great concern around that, came together to think about what might we be able to contribute um, to changing that data um, and that experience for folks. Um, what that led to though, was something much more powerful than what we imagined back then. And it has become what Vibrant Hawaii is today, which is a, a real place for folks to be able to come together across, across districts. Uh, we live on a really big island and oftentimes um, folks are working within their district and um, not aware of what's going on or the resources available to them across districts, um, working across disciplines and across sectors. And um, one of the things that we decided on early on was to change uh, the goal. And so oftentimes we had heard, we just need everyone paddling in the same canoe. And you may have heard that as well. And what we said was, we need everyone to stay in their own canoe and be excellent at what their charge is mm -hmm. and do the very best at what they are called to do, but we can paddle in that same direction. And so there was a lot of time spent to um, in conversation about what is that same direction. And that really started the conversation of what is our vision of a vibrant Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the first conversations that we um, took around the island and asked folks to share with us, what is their vision of a vibrant Hawaii? There was a lot of universal themes that came up, but what folks shared became the priority areas or what we now call streams in our work. And so we have five of those streams or priority areas that we focus on and bring people together to work collectively on, which is our Hawaii Island Housing Coalition, our health and well-being stream, our economy stream, um, education, financial resilience, and our resilience hubs. This is great. It's a lot to cover too. So um, going back a little bit, you mentioned Alice Report, and um, I know you took part in um, working on the Alice Report. Can you tell us just briefly what it is um, so the audience is familiar with you know, the, the national um, trends that have been emerging with Alice reports, yeah. um, what it highlighted about Hawaii, but really I wanna focus on what it didn't show. So mm -hmm. you can tell us about that. Yeah, so Alice is an acronym that stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And so these are working folks, our working families um, who are 
above the federal poverty level threshold, but are not earning enough income to meet a basic survival budget. And there's, there's specific things within that survival budget that include housing, transportation, health, food, some technology, um, like internet access and childcare. And so again, this measure is looking at how many households are employed, but do not meet that minimum survival budget to, um, mm -hmm. yeah. What we, so again, for Hawaii Island, a high percentage of households living in Alice or in poverty, what we actually saw that was really encouraging was the poverty level was actually decreasing on Hawaii mm -hmm. Island. And that was an indication that our social services are doing an incredible job at what they are called to do um, and their mission. But what was happening was folks were moving out of poverty and right into Alice. And so oftentimes um, living in that gap of, and we've heard it a lot in Hawaii, making too much to get any kind of assistance, but not mm -hmm. enough to be able to make ends meet. And so that's really um, the situation that folks in Alice are in. When we went around the island and asked folks to tell us their story about um, their, their experience with poverty or the way that they're struggling, what we were surprised to hear, which really changed the focus of our work um, early on, were folks not identifying with the idea of being poor. So when we, when we presented the working poor, which is mm -hmm. the way the story often gets told, um, more often than not, people were saying, well, we don't feel poor. And so we asked why. And we were told things like, well, you know, I live in Pune, where the data shows that 78% of folks at the time were living in Alice or in poverty. And they said, well, we don't feel poor because we might be the worst when it comes to income, but we're the best when it comes to ohana. And none of us are making it on our own. And all of us are making it because of ohana. We went down to Ka'u, where it's 77% in Alice or in poverty. Um, the folks there said, we like it like this. And I was so shocked to hear that, that I wrote it on, you know, <laughs> I have my, my post-it board and I wrote, we like it like this, because I thought, surely that's, I didn't hear that correctly. How, how could that be? And then they started to talk about the reciprocity and the way that they live as community and I will help you watch your kids and you will help me fix my car. And there's still a lot of sharing of food resources happening um, and they'd like it like that. And so it made us curious around what is wealth and what is our definition of wealth on Hawaii Island? And it really brought to light an opportunity to shift a deficit narrative that is being told about who we are it was an opportunity to lean into the practices of data justice and in what is, um, is talked about restoring the broken dignity of a people by the stories that are being told about a community. And so we asked folks, we, we had a huge gathering and this was a really tremendous like mind shifting um, exercise. We had 200 folks together. This is pre-COVID of course. And, um, Everyone in the room was given 10 beans and they sat on tables and at each table there was four bowls and there was a bowl that represented human capital, a bowl that represented social capital, a bowl that represented natural capital and a bowl for financial capital. And we asked these stakeholders, government officials, social service executives and business leaders, faith leaders, you know, folks representing the community, just a broad, diverse stakeholder group. In your vision of a vibrant Hawaii, how do you invest your 10 beans in these four different areas, human, social, natural, and financial capital? And they put their beans in the bowls and we counted it all up. And then we asked in the reality of your life today, how do you invest your beans? And we counted it all up. And then we asked in the sector that you're representing today, how do you see your sector investing their beans? And we counted it all up. And the data from that exercise really informed what we know for our island defines wealth and what, what is wealth to us. Because the highest investment in our vision of a vibrant Hawaii is our human capital. 
what we feel that we're able to contribute in a meaningful way. The second was social capital, the relationships that we have with each other. The third highest contribution was toward natural capital and that kinship that we have with Aina. And the least valued of the four was financial capital. It was really telling. And so for us, when we now have the opportunity to own our narrative and to be saying, are we hitting our goals? Are we being successful according to the values that we have on our island? We're able to measure it across those. Are we contributing in ways that are meaningful to a greater collective? Are we building relationships and sharing with each other and, and connecting in those ways? And, and that's been a really powerful shift. Yeah. And, you know, as a researcher, this is an important lesson for all of us to think about that um, people perceived facts as neutral, but data collection starts with first asking the right questions, right? So um, to, when we were dealing with policy making, we first have to find out what is it that we're measuring. Mm -hmm. So th there's a shift that you're working on from, you know, moving away from traditional data collection for economic well-being and redefining what economic well-being means in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, so do you see, now that you've experienced that and you've had these conversations with community leaders and stakeholders, do you see the gaps between the actual needs and wants of the communities that you serve and the policies that are coming? from the state and county governments that are meant to address these needs? We did um, a follow-up and it was specifically under our stream or our priority area of financial resilience. And this was a really interesting cross-sector approach um, to what we typically think about when we think about financial literacy or financial resilience. Mm -hmm. and. Because of the, the experience that we had had, again, at that convening where we launched Vibrant Hawaii and had those 200 stakeholders together, one of the areas that were presented around health and well-being was around ACEs and BCEs, so adverse and beneficial childhood experiences and the impact that those early experiences have on long-term and adult health. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we learned in that presentation was also around trauma-informed care and the impacts that trauma has. We did a really interesting exercise where we had um, folks anonymously fill out uh, a survey of sorts that had five adverse experiences and five benevolent experiences. And we said, if it's true for you to, to check the box, and it was completely done anonymously. At the end of the exercise, folks folded up their responses and passed it around the room and continued until nobody knew whose paper they were holding or where their form was. And then we had everyone sit down and one by one, we read off these prompts. Did you, as under the age of 18, did you experience divorce? Did you have a family member who lived with alcoholism or substance use issues? Um, and then as we read them out, if it was marked on their form, we asked them to stand up for the person whose paper they were holding. And folks in the room were so surprised to see that the number of adverse childhood experiences and traumatic childhood experiences was not uh, limited to the to those people mm. that we often think about. Oh, yeah. Those people have done it, and it was the awareness of this is us. This is all of us. We've all experienced adversity. We've all experienced benevolence in our life. And so when we talk about community, we're not talking about those people. We're talking about us. That leads into this conversation of financial resilience because we took that learning from a very different discipline and applied it to financial resilience. And so we said, if we know that trauma impacts a person's brain, physically impacts your brain mm -hmm. and makes it difficult to hold on to um, a distant optimistic future. And we know through science, that's what trauma does. 
makes it very difficult to hold on to existing confidence in the future. We said within financial resilience, isn't that exactly what a savings account is? Isn't that exactly what a retirement account is? And so how do we begin to take the science and the learning that we're having around with trauma and brain formation and everything and use it to be able to make good decisions in the programs that are coming out to support people's financial resilience? Um, and then this group of wonderful, wonderful folks who are amazing in their field said, I think we don't understand enough about this. Like we understand income and expenses and budgeting and all of this, but we don't understand the lived experience of folks. We had one person say, I don't need you to tell me how to budget because I know how to budget. I can take $10 and feed my family of six for a week. I know how to budget. You know? <laughs> And so we started on another kind of listening, and it was a system mapping exercise that was called Get Chance, Get Choice. Mm -hmm. And this was really inspired by former Mayor Billy Kinoy um, at the dedication of a permanent supportive housing project had said, everybody just wants to know that they get chance and they get choice. And we have found over and over and over for that to be so true. And so I think to um, going back to your question in what are the gaps that we're seeing between the actual needs that the community has and the decisions that are being made to support. I think those are two really important pieces. One, realizing that um, we're talking about all of us. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about those people. Yeah. And second, that the solutions being applied need to consider various, we, we use the word makavalu a lot these days, being able to see it from all different perspectives. And so when you're approaching housing, you're not just looking at the building and the unit, you're really looking and considering the, the environment and the relationship that folks will have with that environment, um, considering the, the education and the access to education within that geographic area. Is there in broadband infrastructure available for the people moving there? Is there school? Are the schools maxed out? Um, is there capacity for the schools? Is yeah. there access to health in that area? Is there spaces for folks to be growing their own medicine in that area? What is, how are we going to design a community rather than just designing a housing? unit. Um, and so um, I think there's a lot to be said in yeah. the approach of bringing different stakeholders together, different disciplines to look at any kind of solution that comes up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. I mean, it's exactly what I think of policy is that it is systemic, right? You can't just approach it from a single industry's perspective and to say we just we're just only going to do housing and not think about unintended consequences that may or may not occur. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about choice, um, do you feel like in your conversations with um, people on Hawaii Island, is there a feeling of that, that their choices are limited or that their voices are not being heard or considered? Yeah, you know, what was really surprising to me from our very first, you know, tour around the island and talking to people was when we asked that question around, you know, you're working poor, uh, do you feel poor? And they were like, we don't feel poor. One of the indicators of why folks did not identify with poverty or feeling poor was if they had choice. And so saying, um, I don't feel poor because I choose to be a stay-at-home mom. I choose to be a foster mom. I chose to not take a promotion at work that would have made me have to travel a lot because I want to come home and um, be able to take care of my aging parents. So that, that ability to have a choice was powerful. You know, when we talk about um, even housing, it's not that everyone wants to live in a luxurious yeah. 2,000 square foot home. And so our housing coalition takes care to um, 
understand that we need a spectrum of housing options. Mm -hmm. And I think the approach that Vibrant Hawaii takes is always give people options, give people choice, because the ability to have a choice is an indication that um, allows folks to experience wealth and what wealth mm -hmm. means. Yeah, it, it sounds like we need to move away from this cookie cutter single trajectory where your success is defined by, you know, your the big house, a eight to five job or whatever it is, you know, just rethinking success and wealth that fits different um, sets of people and communities and priorities. Yeah. And it's um, not only applicable to um, policy, it, it, it has been very applicable to um, grant support. Mm. Um, one of the projects that we had the privilege of leading uh, towards the end of last year through CARES funding was with our resilience hubs. And we quickly learned as an organization who was giving out funds to support community that a cookie cutter approach did not work. And our community was so great to like tell us early on <laughs> <laughs> and help us to learn. And they were really our teachers in how to do this. It, and it's a lot of work, but yeah. so incredibly effective. Thank you. Um, I asked my guests this question. It's a very important one. Um, if you were sitting at the decision-making table with your expertise, your, your work, um, the communities that you serve, as a decision-maker, what policies, both short-term and long-term, would you put into place um, for your communities? I can share what I've heard. What folks from Hawaii Island have shared with me is very yeah. important. Um, at the top of the list, starting at a federal level, the Jones Act, there is a lot of um, hardship placed on our community, on small businesses, um, just across the board because of the Jones Act. Um, state and county procurement policies, uh, you know, re-looking at the way that is written and the impacts that it has on small businesses, which ultimately has an impact on working families. Mm -hmm. um, minimum wage, access to early learning, um, right now, there's a lot of speculation buying happening on our island, I'm sure across the state, but there are a huge um, impacts happening as a result of that. Um, looking at our building codes, that's a hot topic right now on our island and with our housing shortage and the way that, um, you know, there's an international standard and some of those do not apply living in a mm -hmm. tropical climate like Hawaii, but really looking that um, the language within is not being altered to serve special interest groups. Um, one of the things that we are really leaning towards, um, and, and a lot of it has been um, inspired by the work of the Aina Aloha Economic Futures Group, is looking at Aina-based education because sustainability is such a hot topic right now. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the content of Aina-based education, these are really the experts at the kinds of Hawaii that we are trying to reach. And so um, within our hiring practices, within our promoting practices, are we recognizing the skill set of students who have come out of Aina based education schools um, and prioritizing their knowledge as expertise? Um, and the last is when we heard from community about access to resources, the vision of a vibrant Hawaii more than any other word, this word access came up access to resources, um, and then realizing how many resources we have access to that are not typically recognized as um, just rich, rich, abundant resources, mm -hmm. and how can we integrate those within our everyday practice and utilization. And so within our health and well-being stream, looking at things like being able to work in a lo'i, being able mm -hmm. to have access to a fish pond, a loko ia, and the benefits that has both on your physical and mental health 
and how might we begin to normalize and integrate access to these resources within things like employee assistance programs that already recognize other practices like yoga and meditation? How can we begin to integrate what Hawaii uniquely has to offer and provide access to our, to our working folks there? These are, of course, great ideas, all of them, and, and you know, it's not surprising because you're doing the actual work and you're well informed in everything that you've just um, stated. I'm going to hang on to the low hanging fruit here. I'm hoping that someone does watch this and actually um, takes some of your advice. So I think, you know, you mentioned procurement policy. It seems like it's something that to be easily fixed. So what is it, uh, how would you fix that for the state and county procurement policy to help small business? I think having, um, you know, just looking at the lowest bid is not always beneficial or um, realistic for businesses in Hawaii because of the Jones Act, because we pay extra for shipping because everything yeah. has to come over. Um, so I think, you know, re-looking at that in, in the negative ripple effects that simply going for the lowest bid has. If the intent is to keep as much money that is generated from taxpayers in Hawaii and to keep that money in Hawaii, um, that's huge. The other piece that we're really interested in is building the capacity of our community to really um, understand the process of getting onto some of the government um, professional services list in things like cons consultation and facilitation and some of these um, bids that often go out to companies not from Hawaii. And then what we've all seen and experienced as a result is folks coming in, experts being brought in from not Hawaii that spend the majority yeah. of time in their contract getting to know our community. And so our community already knows our community. And so if we can be building their capacity so that more of these contracts are being awarded to the community who already knows who they are, um, then, then that would, that would um, make a, have a huge benefit for economic prosperity on our island as well. Yeah, that's a um, great suggestion. I know we, we have one minute left to go and I do want to bring up the amazing program that you've been doing, the Resilience Hubs, if you can briefly tell us about what that looks like and, and um, yeah, just go. Oh. <laughs> yes, so in one minute. So we've, had, we've now worked with probably over 40 communities um, and uh, it's really community-led um, and we have just been more behind the scenes supporting in uh, building capacity in providing administrative support, but these are um, community led community driven initiatives in physical spaces that look like anything from a church to a county parks gym to um, a, a nonprofit uh, organization. It's um, that understand the needs of community and bring folks together from their community to meet the needs in their community. It has gone in its first iteration from um, emergency supports around food, access to food and assistance in connecting kids to distance learning. Um, it has moved to, to building economic resilience and, and communities ideas around um, designing and innovating of what economic initiatives might be successful in their community. Um, and we are looking now at our, our third round of supporting these community hubs and just really excited about what's to come. That's wonderful. I'm, I know we could talk for hours and I'm just so happy that we got to chat and got to um, hear your manao about the work that you're doing and the importance of it. Mahalo, thank you very much. Um, I am Minar Mordecai and we were speaking and I was speaking with Janice Ikeda, the executive director of Vibrant Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha.